Hey, welcome to the Reparadigm Podcast. Today we're doing something a little bit different. We're just doing a Q&R episode responding to some of the questions and comments that we've gotten from our How to Read the Bible series. I hope it helps. Hey, we're going to take this opportunity just to address a few of the questions that we've received as we've gone through this How to Read the Bible series. All right, Nick, I'm going to give you this first one, okay? Those first questions come in from a few people, but in kind of the same form. So it's generally formed something like this. I understand what you're saying about contextual reading, but when I read the Bible during my daily quiet time, I'm trying to hear from God directly. What does being familiar with all this biblical context have to do with God communicating to me directly when I read the Bible? Yeah. I've had several people kind of express the same type of thing, like you said, maybe in different words, but the same type of concern expressed here. And I feel it. So I've thought about it a little bit. And there's a few things I want to say. First, I want to say that, yes, it's true that God can and does sometimes communicate directly to us. We affirm that the spirit of God has the role of impressing on our minds and our affections what the will of God is. And we have to listen to him when we feel like that's happening. Some people have very vivid experiences of hearing from God. There's stories from all over the world, actually, especially like Muslims who have visions of Jesus and then come to believe in Jesus of Nazareth. Or, you know, I've heard stories of of actually Jewish people who have visions of Messiah Jesus and reform their beliefs in accordance with with his rule. Um, So vivid experiences of God happen and they seem to be real in a lot of cases. So that's the first thing I'd say for sure. But the second thing I want to say is that God can do that. (laughs) He can give us vivid experiences of himself through a host of practices, not just through Bible reading. It's not like the Bible is a particularly special tool that acts as a medium to channel God's special presence or anything like that. God speaks to us sometimes vividly through nature, through fasting, through prayer, through service to people in need through conversations with other people, through worship, through testimony, when we hear somebody testify of the grace of God, the kindness of God in their life, through preaching, when we're listening to people expound the word of God, through suffering, as C.S. Lewis said, that's God's megaphone sometimes to speak to us, through intentional silence, when we put down our smartphones and just spend a day or hours in silence. A whole day. Yeah. (laughs) And obviously, like I said, through through dreams and, and visions too. I mean. The point is God can and God often does, it seems, speak to his people directly through a host of practices and experiences. And we should always be open to the encouragement and conviction that the Holy Spirit gives when that happens. But that doesn't only happen when we crack open the Bible. The third thing I would say then is that we shouldn't use the Bible to try to manipulate God into giving us that experience that we want. He can give it if he wants, but we don't use the Bible or any of these spiritual practices to try to manipulate God. We should always go into Bible reading, trying to discern what the author meant to the author's audience. Though God can and does sometimes give us vivid experiences of himself when we read the Bible, even beyond what the objective meaning of the Bible means, sometimes it seems like, that's no reason to go into Bible reading looking for that experience. That would be like my going into this conversation with you, not really listening to what you're actually saying, because I'm so focused on trying to hear the voice of God in that conversation, or like my going into an opportunity to serve somebody to help meet their need, but I'm so focused on the experience I'm getting out of it that I'm not really connecting with them. I'm not really being attuned to them and their needs, and I'm not really focused on just serving them. And then in hindsight, maybe reflecting on if God was in that or not. So you're saying that it's possible to be so focused on trying to hear God directly that maybe we can give up actually just trying to understand what God has already said to us through the text. Absolutely. Yeah, we can just miss out on the normal means of communication. And in this case, the normal means of communication with the Bible is trying to understand what the author was trying to communicate to their audience and then applying that wisdom for our time and our place today. And so, yeah, I mean, that's the fourth thing I would would want to say basically is we should attempt to understand the Bible's message on its own terms. And and we can miss that. I definitely think it's possible to miss that when you're looking for something else when you're going into your Bible reading time in the morning. Now, though you're open to something else happening, for sure, 
it's it's kind of odd to substitute the normal means of communication, what God has already said to his people for something else, what I want to hear from God that day, though I'm open to God speaking to me that that day. Yeah. So the that Bible is a story of what God has done throughout history. So if we're going to try to understand the way we're going to live in that story, we need to understand that story on its own terms first. Yeah. If God had just intended to give us a collection of little pieces to meditate on so that he could speak to us directly, I imagine the Bible would look really different. Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. If that's the way we were intended to interact with the Bible primarily, it's hard to imagine that it would include all of these stories of ancient Israel and then even all these stories about Jesus, the way that they're told, or letters of Paul to specific churches in specific times and places. Like, if it was just intended to be this collection of sayings to meditate on, the Bible was written really weird if that was its primary purpose. Right. And, and some of it is, you know, collections of sayings to meditate on, but not all of it and not most of it. If the Bible was written as a guide to meditative practice, then you would expect to see more instructions on breathing. <laughs> we don't find anything like that in, in the Bible. I'm not saying that's like all illegitimate. I'm just saying the Bible wasn't written that way. The last thing I want to say is it's, I'm going to double down on this. Thanks for helping me think through this. But reading the Bible well is part of spiritual formation. It's not like we are advocating a Bible reading method that is some academic pursuit that has nothing to do with growing closer to God. On the contrary. Yeah, and we're not discounting the importance of talking about the spirit of God and how we can experience God and things like that. But it's, it is beyond the scope of our podcast series, at least, to talk about the value of prayer and meditation and service and fasting and communing and worshiping and sitting in silence and immersing in nature and all the spiritual practices that can be beneficial. Like these would all be wonderful topics to discuss in a different podcast series or probably better yet, a different podcast altogether from somebody who actually knows something about those things. <laughs> But you and I are sticking to what we know here, and we're trying to help remedy what we perceive to be a real problem in the evangelical church, at least in our context in the United States. Namely, that, frankly, we're terrible at understanding the Bible. And therefore, our theology and our ethics get all bent out of shape. And we start doing really strange things. We start forming our communities, our churches around very strange ideas and not living faithfully. So this affects the story that we tell ourselves every day. Every, every day somebody wakes up, they tell themselves a story. They live in a story, an ongoing story in their mind, and it tells them who they are and where they're going. Our bad theology <laughs> that comes from bad Bible reading informs the story we tell ourselves every day. And therefore, if we have a story that isn't faithful to what God has communicated to us in the Bible, then, uh, yeah, then we're maybe lost. We're, we're not... Um, you could get pretty far from the central ethics, from the central story, from the central message that Jesus has, from the central identity that God has revealed in the Jewish and Christian Bible. Yeah. I always think of it like a boat. <laughs> if that boat isn't grounded to the dock, it's going to drift out to sea. And in the same way, if, if our understanding of what Scripture is teaching us is not grounded in that historical context, it's very easy to start drifting out into sea and to start making the Bible talk about things that it doesn't actually want to talk about. It's easy for us to just kind of take that story wherever we want. If you take a small piece of any part of scripture, you rip it out of context, and you just choose to focus on that piece, it's possible to start understanding that piece to mean something very different from what it intentionally was designed to say. Mm -hmm. It's like that boat drifting out to sea. And when we do this corporately, when we all start treating the Bible like this, you know, we all get accustomed to just interacting with the text in this very you know, individualistic, kind of introspective way, it's easy for us all to just kind of start drifting away from the grounding of this text. So what we're arguing is that as part of our spiritual practice, we all need to be together, making sure that we're reading the Bible in a very focused way, taking the context very seriously so that we get pulled back to shore by the Bible. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good Bible reading is not divorced from individual spiritual formation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not at all. We think that a good hermeneutical method will be really fruitful for individuals and life-giving to people. But our, just to repeat, our, our focus has not been in particular on the individual, personal, subjective experience of the divine in our podcast. And maybe other people are talking about that. And that's great. <laughs> yes. Go ahead and listen to them too. I think those are all important parts. and. Good Bible study plays an important role in spiritual development. And if we 
don't do that important Bible reading, because we're so focused on the other aspects of spiritual development, we lose something critical. We lose out on an amazing gift that God has given the church. Yeah. Just one example here. If I come into the Bible, and because of the culture I've grown up in, if I'm assuming that individualistic personal holiness here on earth before I go to heaven when I die is the focus of scripture, it's really, really easy for me to drop into, let's say, an epistle of Paul and start reading it like it's written to me. Yeah. The bits that are obviously weird to me that are talking about Jews and Gentiles, I'll kind of skim over those a little bit. Yeah, in circumcision. Yeah, in circumcision. Yeah, that, that doesn't seem quite as relevant. Or maybe I'll spiritualize circumcision. You okay. Know? <laughs> I could spend the rest of my life every day focusing on little bits of Paul's letters, you know, in my English translation, and really meditating on it, wanting to hear God and never really understand some of the key points he's making in these letters. If I every day go into this saying, Holy Spirit, help me understand how this letter is going to benefit my pursuit of individualistic personal holiness, I'm never going to understand the corporate emphasis of Paul's letters. Yeah, though that might be a good question, you actually haven't read the Bible well enough to understand that that isn't the main question that the Bible wants you to be asking. Yes, and I think that is a great point you make there. The Bible should drive the questions we ask. I think we get into this pattern a lot of times of saying, take your questions, take your concerns, bring them into the Bible looking for answers. That's not inherently bad, but you're not using the fullness of the Bible for what it's supposed to be doing. The Bible is a story that when you keep it grounded, that story is going to start to challenge the actual questions you're asking. It's going to shape the underlying assumptions, and it's going to start causing you to ask new questions. I think good reading of the Bible is actually going to cause you to like step out of your cultural context and start to see it for what it is you're going to start to ask much, much bigger questions than you ever would have on your own. Yeah. It forces us to re-paradigm our worldview, to re-paradigm the questions we're asking, which then continues to re-paradigm our worldview, which it's just an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually think that the archaeology, the manuscript discoveries, the scholars and other people who are dedicated to helping the church understand this are all gifts from God to the church. I think the Holy Spirit is working in and through those things. So it's a little silly, I think, for somebody to say, ah, well, because I'm listening to the Holy Spirit, there's no need for me to be seeing all of this other stuff that's going on. Oh, wow. Yeah, one would be ignoring the spiritual gifts that God has given to the church by ignoring the hard work that people have done by the Spirit of God to enlighten better reading of the Bible, to enlighten, enlighten the meaning of the Bible to 21st century people. Yeah, if somebody said, oh, well, I'm not going to listen to the people that God has given the gift of prophecy because I like to listen to the God in prayer, you'd say, well, hey, there's a corporate aspect here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't just go off by yourself and assume that you have the full message of God given directly to you. That's not how he's worked through history. Hmm. Okay, there's another question that's come up a couple of times in the case. So, so riddle me this, okay? The hermeneutical approach you're advocating is not easy. Normal people can't do it. Doesn't it ask too much of ordinary Christians who just want to read the Bible and understand God's will for themselves individually, I will add? Yeah. Yeah, this has come up in a couple of conversations I've had too. So we thought we'd, we'd tackle it here. Um, yeah, a couple of things. I mean, first, if this hermeneutical method we're espousing, we'll call it the contextual hermeneutical method. If this method is difficult, it's only because we haven't been doing it or haven't been teaching our people to do it and our kids how to do it. That's no one's fault but ours. Once we get with the program and train ourselves and the next generation how to do it better, it's going to be easier for them. <laughs> so it, won't have to be, it doesn't have to be hard for everybody for all time, for all places. And in addition to that, even if it is difficult, that's no excuse. Like, do hard things sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> People sometimes suppose that we should simply take the plain meaning of the Bible. But then the question you have to ask is plain to whom? Well, I think the obvious meaning to me is the obvious meaning to the author and his audience. As humans, we're very good at assuming that our own cultural expectations are like the cultural norms of everybody. Anybody who's ever traveled outside their own country suddenly realizes, oh, hey, a lot of the things that I just assumed were central and normative to all of humanity are in fact not. Right. I mean, the obvious meaning to me is different than the obvious meaning to an Arab Bedouin or to someone in a, in a different cultural context. 
So what if the plain meaning to me conflicts with the plain meaning to them? What interpretation is then valid? Or what if we find when we study the cultural context of the Bible and we realize a plain reading to them probably would have been very different from the plain reading to us? You then have this really interesting question you've got to ask yourself. Okay, so given this big cultural barrier, if my plain reading does not line up with the plain reading of the authors in their own context, which one's right? If you're going to stick with this idea that, oh, well, my plain reading must just be the correct reading of the text, you're actually claiming then that the original audience of the Bible, and in fact, probably much of church history, simply did not understand this text until culture changed enough that the plain reading became the right meaning. As if God gave some mystery through an author and said, okay, unfortunately, none of you guys are going to understand this until we get to modernity and hyper-individualism. Then all of a sudden, the real meaning of this will be revealed to my church. Yeah. So the concern that like the Bible should be plain enough for normal people to understand, I, I understand the concern there. But the plain meaning needs to be the plain meaning of the author's probable intent to their audience. <laughs> yes. And I'm not suggesting that everything you read in the Bible, you're going to completely misunderstand. No, not at all. We've, we've talked about that too. This is sort of a, sort of a fallacy to like throw up your hands and just give up on it and be like, ah, oh, no, normies can't understand the Bible because this all seems too hard. Like we, we've, we've said this explicitly on the podcast. If you read big, the bigger you read, in other words, read faster, read more at once, try to consume chunks of the Bible at a time, the bigger you read, the message is, is more universal. I mean, it's, it's a grand narrative. So you can pick up on the main ideas without a ton of contextual studies and all that stuff. But if you want to really focus in, develop your theology and stuff like that, then yeah, there's one way to do that. And we've expressed that it takes a little bit of work, but we've expressed the way to do it. Yeah. You've also mentioned before that we should read the Bible like we read other texts. While the messages inspired, the actual means of communication are still very human. There was no special command given to people for how they were supposed to read and interpret these texts. They're given the same way humans communicate in general. So in general, if you stick with, hey, read the Bible like you would read other ancient literature, you know, I think you're lots of times going to end up doing better. There is this kind of strange thing where when we talk about the plain reading of a text, what we're actually referring to is, ah, well, my church's traditional reading. A lot of the things that we consider to be the plain meanings of the text are not something that would be plain to somebody who walked into a church and read the Bible for the first time? Absolutely not. No, I've personally experienced this, for sure. So it's possible for a church to get this pattern of reading a specific text, a specific way of understanding it, and then say to themselves, oh, this is now clearly the plain meaning. And anybody who disagrees with this is now disagreeing with the plain meaning. And by plain meaning, what they're really referring to is their own specific traditional interpretation. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And unfortunately, I mean, that is not submitting to the plain meaning of the communication of the text in their time and place. And I mean, our church traditions and our doctrinal affirmations need to be reformed, reshaped according to that original plain meaning all the time. It's some work, but we need to always submit ourselves to that. Kind of gets us to my my last thing I wanted to say here is, is it that hard though? <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, for all the worries that this is making Bible reading some academic pursuit that most people can't do, it's not actually all that hard. It's relatively easy. It may be different from what we've been doing when we've been reading the Bible. We may need to learn a new habit in this case, but it's never been easier to know the probable cognitive environment of the ancient people who wrote the Bible than it is today. Well, it might have been easier for the people living in the ancient environment. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Beyond, <laughs> beyond their time and place. Yeah, especially as you stretched out over time. I mean, anyone who has connectivity to the internet, which turns out to be a lot of people, I, I realize there's exceptions here. It turns out that a lot of people have connectivity to the internet. There's never been so many professional scholars and teachers making media, very consumable media for normal people that helps us understand the biblical context. There's also never been as much access directly to primary sources, to ancient people through their primary source writings, thanks to modern discoveries and translations of those discoveries, basically all of which you can just find on the internet. Yeah, our access to that is crazy easy now. <laughs> just a simple web search will find you an incredible amount of resources that you can go read translations of. 
Yeah. Like that work is instantly available. Yeah. I would also say that even if you're not interacting with these sources directly, just being aware of the fact that the Bible was written into a different context. So going into scripture with just that thought in your head, hey, just because there's something that's a plain meaning to me here in my cultural context does not mean that that's necessarily the same plain meaning the authors intended. Just having that little bit of awareness going into the text can make a huge difference. So when you read something that seems very strange, rather than feeling like, oh, I just need to skip this, sitting there for a second and saying, okay, well, they're living in a different world. Using those moments as a reminder, I think, can help keep you on a much better path when you're doing your Bible reading. Yeah. When Paul talks about the enemies of the gospel, he's not particularly referring to those people that you have in your mind that you don't like. Yes. So there may be a learning curve <laughs> once you get going on a good contextual hermeneutic. It's not all that hard. Mm -hmm. Maybe just change your habits a little bit and we'll be good to go. Yeah. Start with just being willing to ask that question. Anytime you hear somebody interpreting or describing what the Bible means, just ask yourself, is this coming from a grounded, contextualized understanding of scripture or is this coming from somewhere else? Yep. What is the probability that the biblical author meant what this teacher is trying to say he meant? Yes. This boat analogy is like so strong in my head, so I'm going to keep coming back to this. When I hear somebody interpreting scripture or trying to tell me what the biblical authors meant, what I want them to show me, show me the rope, show me the dock, show me how the two are tied together. Because if you can't show me that, you can walk me around a boat all day. Show me like a really pretty set of theological beliefs that all go together. You can show me how they're attached to the text. But if you can't show me how this interpretation is tied to the dock, I'm going to be a little concerned. Yeah, man, for sure. Those are a couple of the questions that we've had just interacting with some of the folks that have listened to the podcast. We appreciate people expressing them. And yeah, hopefully some of that response is helpful. I wanted to add to you, I was reading this article the other day, and some of the objections made in this article to a good contextual reading of, of the Bible reflected some of the conversations that I've had with folks as well. So I thought it'd be interesting to read some of these quotes from this article. And I just want Matt's hot take on them. All right. All right. All right, so I'm going to quote what this article says. Here, the author is critiquing John Walton, whom we've had on the podcast. He says, of course, John Walton thinks Genesis 1 through 11 is a difficult text. The implications are clear. The ancient Near Eastern literature, which only scholars like Walton can read, has made it possible to correctly understand Genesis 1 through 11. He says later, however, it does not follow from this that one should adopt Walton's ancient Near Eastern hermeneutic. He has set up a false dichotomy that goes something like this. Since the Old Testament was originally written to ancient Israelites, then if one desires to understand the Old Testament, he must either be an ancient Israelite or study the extant writings from their pagan neighbors. But this makes the Old Testament incomprehensible for all but scholars of the ancient Near Eastern literature. So to restate, this is sort of like on the, isn't the Bible for normies <laughs> question. Uh, to restate, if the contextual hermeneutic that we're advocating is right then only like intellectual elites can understand the Bible. And we normies are all stuck listening to and following them. But I thought the Bible was for me. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. It's a little strange to me to tell people to go read their English translations of a Bible and then also to tell them that they shouldn't have to rely on specialists to understand the Bible. They already have if they're reading an English Bible. <laughs> yes. If you're going to pick up a translation of the Bible, you're already relying on the work of a bunch of people who've dedicated themselves to finding, preserving, reading, understanding, and translating these ancient Hebrew, Aramaic, and these Koine Greek texts. So if it wasn't for God providing these dedicated specialists throughout history, we would have no way to actually even maintain or keep or read these biblical texts today, much less understand them. And it's not like there's some hard distinction between the people who have translated these texts and then scholars who are helping us understand them. This line between translation and interpretation doesn't really exist. It's kind of just this mixed pot. So when we're reading a translation of the text, we are already relying on the work of scholars who have done some of this interpretive work. To translate an ancient Hebrew text is a very difficult thing to do. You have to know the cultural context, you have to know the language, and you have to know the culture of the world to be able to translate this. If we had just the ancient Hebrew Bible, 
we would really, really struggle to translate it. Mm -hmm. We're already relying on all of the information we can have to help us understand this text already, including texts from outside of the Bible. Like this is true of all biblical translation. To get to know the language that the biblical authors are using, you have to rely very heavily on all of the information and all of the texts we have available because they're, they're dead languages. You can't walk out and go find somebody who speaks the same language that the author of Genesis was speaking. You can't go find somebody who speaks the same language that the author of Paul was using. The languages have changed. The only way that we can reconstruct these languages and understand them is through studying the culture, studying the context. So it's a little strange, given this objection, to say, okay, we need to rely on the work of all of these scholars who have interpreted and translated the Bible for us. And then as soon as it's in English, now all of a sudden it would be wrong to rely on the work of scholars. Mm. It's yeah. just a very strange claim. All right. So your, your response is basically, that's a strange claim. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Well, yeah, in addition, like, I think you had mentioned this yesterday. <laughs> Maybe we just need to be a little bit more humble, too, and actually be fine with leaning on people who know what they're talking about, like read the Bible corporately. <laughs> Maybe I can't do everything on my own, and I need the church, and I need other human beings to help me understand. Yes, as a, as a very individualistic, bootstrapping American here, this reliance on other people can make me a little uncomfortable. But if we look through history, God's people have always relied on a community to reserve, preserve, and understand God's word. God never came down and delivered a set of scrolls to each individual human, not even in, in Israel. His message has always been distributed, read, studied, and accessed with the help of specialists within a community. You know, this side of the printing press, you know, where we all are able to have dozens of Bibles stacked up on our shelves and we've got digital access to stuff. It's easy for us to forget that we are in the lucky minority of Christians and you know God followers throughout all of history who have really easy access to this text for ourselves. Just because I can go easily find you know a dozen different translations in English doesn't remove this idea that God intended these texts to be for a community and to be interacted with through a community. So when God sends specialists who are willing to do this work and spend their whole lives studying the Old Testament context or New Testament context, in order to help the church better understand what these texts mean, what they were intended to communicate, it's really maybe narcissistic. Maybe, maybe I'm thinking far too much of myself if I'm going to say, oh, well, I shouldn't need to rely upon their work, their knowledge, their skills, because I just want to be able to understand and read and know the Bible by myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't disagree with you. I think you may have already addressed this, but a second objection that I found in this in this article goes like this. Um, the author actually agrees with us that when we're interpreting the Bible, we're supposed to ask, you know, what was the author's intent? So he says this, quote, thus, when interpreting the Bible, the most important question to ask is what was is the author's intended meaning? And we discover that by reading his words carefully in context and comparing scripture with scripture, since all of it has one divine author, the God of truth, who cannot lie or contradict himself. He goes on to say, quote, we most certainly should not use the demonically influenced, sinfully distorted writings of the ancient Near Eastern pagans or the similarly influenced and erroneous writings of modern evolutionist pagans to interpret the inspired and inerrant word of God, unquote. So, in other words, Matt. Something like, the meaning of the text should be obvious enough simply within the biblical context that it's found in. To think we need to go outside the Bible in order to understand the Bible is to put those outside texts on the level of the Bible. But I thought the Bible alone was inspired by God. Yes, of course, the Bible alone was inspired by God. But the language that it uses to communicate these ideas is not its own distinctive language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If God had communicated using some language that no human spoke, the Bible would not have been especially useful. Mm -hmm. He's communicating using words, phrases, ideas that people understand. So if we want to understand what God was communicating, what these authors were communicating in their texts, we need to be able to understand those languages. The uncomfortable reality here is that if the only ancient Hebrew text we had was the Old Testament. And if the only Koine Greek text we had available to us were the New Testament, we would not be able to understand them very well. Yeah, it'd be pretty difficult. Mm -hmm. Even today, if there is a word or a phrase that occurs only within the biblical texts, 
and we don't see that word or phrase used elsewhere in other contexts outside of the Bible, it's very, very difficult to know what it means. Yeah. It, it becomes a really a question of kind of ungrounded interpretation at that point. Now, we're very, very fortunate that the that list of words and phrases that we don't see anywhere else in yeah, other it's contexts smaller smaller. is getting smaller and smaller. Yes, very fast. Yeah, here's the big bad truth that people need to reckon with if you're skeptical of scholarship. You've kind of circled around this, but it's just true. If you're reading an English Bible, guess what the translators have done to put that text in front of you in English? They've gone to all the other ancient sources to understand the language, to understand the ancient Hebrew language, ancient Hebrew ideas. They've done all that work already. And then that's informed how they're going to translate these words into English. They've done that for Greek already. So you're already depending on them to do all that work and to read all those other texts. So there we go. Sorry, that offends you. It's just, it's true. All right. Uh, I think that's all for the main kind of questions and some pushback, some objections, some concerns that people have had when we've interacted with them. So yeah, in our next podcast series and in our series going forward, we very much welcome people to approach us, email us or whatever, and bring your questions and concerns so we can address them and talk about them. Do another Q&R maybe at the end of our Image of God series as well. Here's some other random feedback I got on the podcast so far on our first series. Why is Matt so sleepy? Uh, That one's very easy. It's because I am sleepy. (laughs) It's 6 a.m. Give Matt a break. (laughs) We both have day jobs and this pod is just a hobby. (laughs) There we go. Um, People have commented on the quality of conversation. They say it's pretty good. And how do we have such good flow? I just say thanks editing software (laughs) because it's not that great in real life if you're sitting in the room with us. Uh, here's one other question I've gotten a few times. Is Nick as attractive in person as he is on the YouTube videos? The answer is yes, of course he is. You haven't gotten that. <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. This Q&R episode officially wraps our How to Read the Bible series. And again, we want to thank Dr. John Walton, Dr. Teresa Morgan, Dr. Joshua Swamidas, and Raleigh Clay for their contributions to this series. Our theme music, as always, is provided by Post Humorous. The Reparadigm podcast is recorded, edited, and produced by Nick Payne and Matthew Westlake. In the new year, we'll have a series on the image of God that we're excited to share with you, and some all-star guest interviews as well. Until then, have a Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah, and a very Happy New Year. Mm-hmm.